Good morning. And a really warm welcome to church this morning. Thankfully, it's not as cold as yesterday, but it's still cold. But we are here together, and I'm sure we'll enjoy the warmth of the church, which is nice. Uh, not many intimations. Uh, just the only one that I've got is that Messy Church meets today from 2 p.m. till 4 p.m. in the Muir Hall. And all are welcome if you wish to brave the cold this afternoon. So please, if you're used to coming to Messy Church or you know anybody that would enjoy it, please come along this afternoon. I'd encourage us now to share the peace with each other. Just round about us, just wish each other the peace of Christ. That will certainly have warmed you up a wee bit as well. <laughs> Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are God's people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, God's steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Today is the last Sunday in the church calendar year, and today we celebrate Christ the King. And there is no better hymn, therefore, to start with other than CH4449, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
realise just how much you appreciate a choir when there is no choir. Um, Zadie and I are feeling a bit isolated up here. Um, but you do, you, the, the, the choir aid our singing, and it's a shame that there's not a choir with us this morning. But I'm sure as we heat up and go through our worship, um, everybody else who's singing will just get a bit louder, and then we'll feel as though the choir are with us. But let us come together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you, the one true living God, who fills the whole universe with life, love and meaning. We praise you for your tremendous love which flows to us and into our lives in Christ. Lord, it is your love that takes the people we are and makes it possible for us to be transformed into the people we are meant to be. We praise you for your love which sets us free from everything that holds us, from everything that squeezes real life out of us and brings us out of darkness into the glorious light of the Father's presence. We praise you for reaching out for us and welcoming us home and for making us your sons and daughters. For the rest, refreshment and hope with which you promise to fill our lives. For the assurance that we will share in the joyful celebration of your creative love and fill the universe with your glory. We praise you here. We praise you now. We will praise you everywhere we go, as long as we live. We will praise you eternally, in ever-increasing joy and worship with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Christ, our King, we come before you seeking forgiveness. When we do not give you the honour due to you, forgive us. When we fail to understand your kingship, forgive us. When we see hunger and thirst but don't see you, open our eyes, our hands and our hearts. When we see loneliness and poverty but don't see you, open our eyes, our hands and our hearts. When we see human frailty and suffering but don't see you, open our eyes, our hands and our hearts. And hear these our prayers. In the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing again hymn 259, Beauty for Brokenness.
The first reading is from Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. <clears throat> For this reason, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers and ask the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit who will make you wise and reveal God to you so that you will know him. I ask that your minds may be open to see his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you, how rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people, and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. And the second reading is Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes as King and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne and the people of all the nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people at his right and the others at his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come, you that are blessed by the Father, come and possess the kingdom which has been pre prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you received me into your homes, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me, in prison and you, you visited me. The righteous will then answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you into our homes, or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this, for one of the least important of these followers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Away from me, you that are under God's curse. Away to the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you would not feed me. Thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you would not welcome me in your homes. Naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you would not take care of me. Then they will answer him, When, Lord, did I ever see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and we would not help you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you refuse to help one of these least important ones, you refuse to help me. These then will be sent off to his eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. Amen. We continue in our worship as our offering is uplifted.
Heavenly Father, we bring to you today not only these, our gifts of money, but also our gifts of ourselves and our talents. You have given us so much that it is only right that we give some of it back to you. We ask that these gifts will be used for the benefit of your son's church here in Uplemoor and throughout the world. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue in prayer as we bring to God our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Lord, that we thank you that you break down barriers that divide and remove the walls we build between us. And Jesus, you have shown us that your grace knows no limits, no boundaries and makes no exceptions. There is nowhere we can go where you and your love will not reach us. There is nothing we can say or do that will ever mean we are beyond the reach of your mercy. There is nothing we can say or do that will ever stop you loving us. Father, we simply cannot understand love like that. We have nothing on earth with which to compare it. We have witnessed no other example of such endless, bottomless and abounding love except in the life, death and resurrection of your Son. We thank you for Jesus and for his demonstration of your life-changing, heart-renewing love in one human life. By the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to love the unlovable, forgive the unforgivable, and touch the untouchable. May we break down the walls of distrust that we have built and remove the barriers of selfishness we have created. You are a different kind of king. You are our king. And you call us to be a different kind of people. Your people. Yours is the world in which we move. Yours are the folk we are summoned to love. Yours is a voice which calls us to care. Help us, we pray, to show your love to the lost, the unloved, the strange, the bereaved, the disheartened, those who fear that their living is all in vain. Help us, we pray, to show your love to the parents who've lost their child, to those who have been abused, to the children abandoned in care, to the weary who find no rest. Help us, we pray, to show your love to those who feel confused by life, to those who are riddled with doubt, to those who are conscious of sin, to those who cry in pain or disgrace. You are our King, and you call us to be a different kind of people. Help us, we pray. And here is now in the silence as we bring our own prayers of intercession, our own prayers for those who are close to us or that we know of who need our prayers. Lord, you have heard all our prayers both spoken and unspoken. So we lift them up to you in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We sing once more hymn, CH4 hymn 724, Christ is the world in which we move.
A story is told about a soldier who was finally coming home after having fought in Vietnam. He called his parents from San Francisco. Mum and Dad, I'm coming home, but I have a favour to ask. I have a friend I'm, I'd like to bring home with me. Sure, they replied, we'd love to meet him. There's something you should know, the son continued. He was hurt pretty badly in the fighting. He stepped on a landmine and lost an arm and a leg. He has nowhere else to go and I want him to come live with us. I'm sorry to hear that, son. Maybe we can help him find somewhere to live. No, mum and dad, I want him to live with us. Son, said the father, you don't know what you're asking. Someone with such a handicap would be a terrible burden on us. We have our own lives to live and we can't let something like this interfere with our lives. I think you should just come home and forget about this guy. He'll find a way to live on his own. At that point, the son hung up the phone and the parents heard nothing more from him. A few days later, however, they received a call from the San Francisco police. Their son had died fallen from a building, they were told. The grief-stricken parents flew to San Francisco and were taken to the city morgue to identify the body of their son. They recognised him, but to their horror, they also discovered something they didn't know. Their son had only one arm and one leg. Perhaps not the type of story you would expect me to start a sermon with, and I've got to admit it perhaps isn't a story that sits comfortably with me, and I imagine with many of you as well, because it makes us think. And for some people, it may relate to something that has happened in our lives or to someone that we know of. That idea of not wanting to accept someone into our families or indeed our lives because they are more likely to upset our daily routine and we can't see ourselves being prepared to love them as Jesus would have done simply because they are different from us. But while the story may be uncomfortable, it points us to the theme of our sermon this morning of loving others as Jesus did. So let me carry on with another story. Newspaper columnist and minister George Crane tells of a wife who came into his office full of hatred towards her husband. I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. Go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be as kind, considerate and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. After you've convinced him of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce. With revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, Beautiful, beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? And she did it with enthusiasm, acting as if. For two months, she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, reinforcing, sharing. When she didn't return, Crane called. Are you ready now to go through with the divorce? Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discovered I really do love him. Her actions had changed her feelings. Here we see someone who didn't love someone because they didn't give her what she wanted when she first married him. There wasn't that connection there anymore. But by trying to convince herself and at the same time try and hurt her husband, who was unlikely to be aware of it all, but in doing all this, found out she actually still did love him. If it hadn't been for her actions, then she wouldn't have realised it. And that is the same for us today. It is by our actions that we can show our love towards others who others in our world perhaps wouldn't. We have the opportunity to love others as Jesus did. What we have seen in the two stories is two types of love. In our second story, we see what becomes the love 
that we experience in our relation, relationships with those closest to us. And then in our first story, we see a love that needs to extend beyond our initial thoughts and opinions about people. A love that goes deeper than the surface of what we see. In our reading from Matthew's Gospel, we see Jesus telling us about what will happen when we get to our judgment. We are told that God will separate the sheep and the goats. Or to put it in our context, those who follow God's will and those who don't. We can have two attitudes to Christ's return to earth. The first one being the person who has no heart for the work of the kingdom. And the second being the person who diligently prepares for it by investing his or her time and talent to serve God. God will separate the obedient followers from the pretenders and the unbelievers. The idea of the sheep and the goats being used is that they both usually graze together and the only time they were separated was when it came for the, to the time for the sheep to be sheared. So the idea of this analogy is to help us realise that in today's society, we too all li live like sheep and goats, believers and unbelievers together, sometimes even in our own families. And so it is up to us to find ourselves in the group that has a second attitude of one who prepares diligently for Christ's return. To be in that group of being obedient. We are told that there is a glorious inheritance waiting for us. A kingdom that has been prepared for us since the creation of the world. A world where everything is perfect. Where there is no pain, no hurt, no, ang no anger where we will see all those who have gone before us to list just a few. The question, though, is how do we go about preparing diligently for Christ's return? There are many ways, but one important way is to be Christ-like here on earth. But what do I mean by being Christ-like? Well, to live our lives the way that Jesus did, to live a life that pleases God. Jesus himself gave us two simple commandments to live by alongside the Ten Commandments. He told us, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. If Matthew had stopped by telling us that God would separate the believers and unbelievers then many of us here this morning would be left sin sitting thinking, well, how do we prepare for Christ's return? I want to know. I want to be ready, but how do I do that? I want to receive that glorious inheritance that is there for us and has been prepared for us. And so thankfully, Matthew doesn't stop there and goes on to retell a parable that Jesus told us to help us understand more of how we can love God with all our heart and how we can love our neighbour as ourselves. How to love others as Jesus did. There are several things repeated in this part of the chapter. And so that in itself tells us that it must be important. One way of doing Bible study and to understand what is being said to us is to really look at what was written. And if there are several words repeated, then we are meant to really look at what they are saying. And so we find such an example in our reading today. And as I remind us of those words, look out for the words that keep getting repeated. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come you that are blessed by my father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me. Thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you received me in your homes. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. In prison, and you visited me. The righteous will then answer him. When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you in our homes, or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, 
I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these followers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Away from me, you that are under God's curse. Away to the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you would not feed me. Thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you would not welcome me in your homes. Naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you would not take care of me. Then they will answer him. When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we would not help you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you refuse to help one of these least important ones, you refuse to help me. These then will be sent off to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. We see the two attitudes that we mentioned earlier on. But we also see Jesus telling us to reach out to others. They are faced here with many examples that many of us would perhaps find difficult to do. To come across someone who is hungry and give them food. Who is thirsty and give them a drink. Welcoming a stranger into your home. Giving clothes to someone who doesn't have any. Looking after someone who is sick or in prison and visiting them. There are those who would find giving someone a drink or some food who need it easier than welcome a stranger into their home. And we may know people around us who are like that. But I think if we are honest with ourselves, we would perhaps find most of them difficult to do. We are a bit like the parents in that first story. We aren't able to show love to others because we can't get by that outer appearance. I'd like you this morning to reflect and think about what it would be like to be people in these situations. You're welcome to either focus on the pictures that come up on the screen as we do it, or you might prefer to close your eyes. How would you feel if you're hungry or thirsty and can't get food or drink? You turn up at the door of the first house that you come to and no one is in, or you're sitting in the street with a begging sign, and everyone keeps walking by you. How would you feel if you're a stranger in a new place and no one is welcoming you? You try to fit in, but you keep getting pushed out. You start to get the sense of being lonely and being unloved. How would you feel if you couldn't afford any clothes and no one around you is helping to clothe you? You start to feel the cold and become isolated because of your fear to go out because of embarrassment. How would you feel if you were sick and no one visited you? Or you are in prison and you were left there with no one visiting you. And now I'd like you to turn your thoughts to someone that you might know who could fit into one of these categories. Perhaps you know someone who's embarrassed because of the way that they look. Someone who is lonely. Someone who doesn't have any friends. Someone at work whom nobody talks to. How can we help them? How might they be feeling? How can we be there for them? And now you can come back to today. You may have found yourself in one of those situations, either those mentioned or are reading, or when we thought of those that we know. 
You may have found yourselves feeling uncomfortable thinking about them. And that is okay. But we are not alone if we have been in these situations or those that we know of. Because Jesus has been there. And it is up to us to ensure that others are not alone. Remember that we are called to live lives that please God. And as Christ has commanded us to love our neighbours as ourselves. We wouldn't want to find ourselves in positions where others do not love us because of our situations. And so we are called to love others as Jesus did. Jesus was often found among those that others didn't want to know. He showed us how to do it. He was found with the tax collectors, the women at the well, those with illness. He went to places that others wouldn't go. He had love for everyone just as his father did. And as the chorus in our final hymn this morning says, and the creed and the colour and the name won't matter, I'll be there. As John tells us in that famous verse, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may not die but have eternal life. I don't know about you, but that is such a wonderful thing that it can sometimes be so much to comprehend. As if to think that God gave his son for the world was a lot to take it in. And so let's replace the word world with your own name and it can be even harder to understand. It didn't matter who we were. He died because he loved each and every one of us. And so let's put our name into that phrase and I encourage you to say it with me. And where the blue line, blue gap is, put your name and we'll say it together. For God so loved Fiona that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. As God loved us, we are called to love others a material of who they are it isn't always easy, and I'm not standing here to say that it is. I find it difficult to love everyone, as I'm sure we all do, and so I'm challenging myself as much as the challenge is there for everyone. We have been given the challenge to love others as Jesus did, and we have been given the examples of how Jesus did it, but how do we go about loving and helping others who are different from us? It isn't easy, and it isn't going to be a walk in the park, but it is something that is expected of us by Jesus. Loving others is part of being a Christian, part of our service to God. We may not always feel like helping others. This is one of the reasons why God sent his Holy Spirit to fill us with the love, compassion, and care that Jesus had. If we ask him to give us this kind of love, he will. If people are hard to serve, remember that serving them is like serving Jesus. We need to imagine it's him who we are helping when we help others. We want to find ourselves going beyond our comfort zones. We need to look beyond what is in front of us. We should make it part of our daily lives. We can be good at helping others in other countries, but we need to start with those around us. Find practical ways of doing it. Buying a beggar on the street a coffee and a cake or something like that. Or visiting folk that we may, not, that we may know but not too well who are sick, perhaps a neighbor. And remember, we are not on our own as we do it. Do we want to be standing on that judgment day that Matthew tells us about at the start of the reading, being asked, why didn't we love others as Jesus did? We don't need to go out and change the world. Start small, as every bit of help is showing Jesus' love to others. And so I leave you with this marvellous thought as we prepare to go out and be like Christ to whoever we come across. For God so love the world.
each one of us here, so much that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. Amen. And the creed and the colour and the name won't matter. Let's stand and sing hymn 544 when I needed a neighbour. Go from this place to serve Christ the King with love and compassion. Go from this place with open eyes, open hands and open hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each one of us and all whom we love and care for this day and forevermore. Amen.